following panel is part of the Comics Arts Conference. The CAC is an academic conference that takes place every year at WonderCon and the San Diego Comic-Con. Our mission is to bring academics and professionals together with the public to discuss the medium that we all love. Because of its academic focus, CAC programming is a little different from other con programming. We hope you enjoy it. You can find more information about the CAC, including how to apply to present at future meetings, at our website at comicsartsconference.wp.txstate.edu. Hi, I'm Sydney Heifler. I'm really happy to introduce our roundtable, The Comic Art of Seduction. With me today, I have Michael Dooley, 2020 Eisner Judge, and Jim Thompson, 2021 Eisner Judge. Um, I'm going to be talking about Matt Baker's work in romance comics and how that had some seduction in it. Michael, what will you be talking about? I am going to be talking about Archie Comics, yeah, specifically, but more so the uh, teenage humor comics that started up in the early 1940s and went into the uh, early 50s and uh, the seductions that uh, went on there with Betty, Veronica, Archie and various other comics folks. And Jim? <laughs> And I'm going to be talking about EC Comics in the uh, 1950 to 1955 and how seduction is represented in the various genres like weird science and horror and crime and even mad. And so we can get the seductions going. Let's go. Hey. I'm Jim Thompson, co-host of the Comic Book Historians podcast, and currently serving as one of the judges for this year's Eisner Awards. I also taught genre theory in film and comics for 15 years uh, for Duke University. My paper today is called The Seduction of Everybody, EC and the Semantic Syntactic Approach to Genre. I want to start with the best definition I could find for the word seduction from Raymond Chandler's The Big Sleep, 1939. She lowered her lashes until they almost cuddled her cheeks and slowly raised them again like a theater curtain. I was to get to know that trick. That was supposed to make me roll over on my back with all four paws in the air. Now, to the year 1953. Apart from his title, Seduction of the Innocent, Dr. Frederick Wortham did not get to the word seduce or seduction until page 10 of his book when he wrote, Slowly, and at first reluctantly, I have come to the conclusion that this chronic simulation, stimulation, temptation, and seduction by comic books are contributing factors to many children's maladjustment. On the next page, describing his interview with a boy who had pulled a switchblade on his teacher, Wortham said, I asked him about his reading. He was enthusiastic about comic books. I looked at some of those he liked best. They were filled with alluring tales of shooting, knifing, hitting, and strangling. I know that many people glibly call such a child maladjusted, but in reality, he was a child well-adjusted to what we had offered him to adjust to. In other words, I felt this was a seduced child. And thus, we get the title, The Seduction of the Innocent. It's a good title, but Wortham was no Raymond Chandler. So what exactly does seduction mean, not according to a Nora writer, but as defined by Merriam-Webster? Def definition of seduce, transitive verb. Number one, to persuade to disobedience or disloyalty. Number two, to lead astray, usually by persuasion or false promises. Number three, to carry out the physical seduction of, enticed to sexual intercourse. Wortham focused on the first two meanings. Comics led children astray. Comics persuaded them to disobey. One of Wortham's most prominent targets, EC Comics, were about the seduction of the innocent, but within its narratives. Therefore, from Wortham's perspective, children were being seduced by tales of seduction, except EC Comics were often about meaning number three, enticement to sexual intercourse but never on its own. It was still linked directly to the disloyalty, disobedience, and false promises within that narrative. Therefore, reading them as seduction 
but you can also read them as morality plays, warnings about seduction. The bigger difference is EC Comics did not limit seduction to the innocent, far from it. It was about the seduction of the lonely, seduction of the cynical opportunist, of the criminal and the romantic fool, seduction of the unwary naive mortal or the space traveling adventurer. Seduction constantly crossed genre lines. These stories were often either about the promise of sex, like in Mad or Weird Science, or the murder one might be willing to do on behalf of sex, as displayed in Vault of Horror or Crime Suspense stories, which is how we get to the twin purposes of this paper. One, exploring the semantics iconography of the seducer and the seduced in EC's very genres. And when I say semantics, I mean their anatomy, clothing, facial expression, and body language signified in those two roles, as well as location and even panel construction. And two, examining how seduction was more than just semantics for EC. The semantics are the building blocks that together formed the syntax, by which I mean the narrative structure and theme for the different genres. For example, one could argue that MAD satirized seduction as a critique on capitalism consumerism. Weird science's seduction was about abject gullibility or paranoia, fear of the future. And the crime books reflected the post-war threat of the woman as competitor, as rival. Therefore, the question here isn't whether EC comics were all about seduction. They were. No, the real question is what that seduction was all about. Before going forward, I should note that because I'm using the term semantics and syntax in relation to genre, they are largely derived from film scholar Rick Altman's seminal book, Film Genre. EC was publishing crime books in the late 1940s, but with the new trend books they published beginning in 1950, they published 27 issues of crime suspense stories from 1950 to 1955, and 18 issues of shock suspense stories during the same time. Johnny Craig, Wally Wood, Reed Crandall, and Jack Kamen were the primary artists on these two books. The first story I want to look at is a Wally Wood story, Came the Dawn, from Shock Suspense Stories. A hunter returns to his cabin to find a naked girl wrapped in a bed sheet. The girl, with, quote, the kind of face you see on magazine covers, had gotten lost and then fallen into a stream and then wandered into uh, the man's cabin. By the next page, we see her changing clothes into something more comfortable. Then there's her dialogue, quote, why not talk about what's yet to begin, meaning us? It's pretty dark out there. I don't think I'd run. You have to wonder, run from what is she saying? Within five panels, the caption reads, I pulled her to me and she came anxiously, almost savagely. Her lips were warm and eager and she pressed against me as we clung together. Bob, darling. By the last, the third panel, third page, you see uh, the seduction. Um, but then he hears a criminally insane blonde killer is on the loose via the radio, assumes it's her, locks her out, and discovers her body the next day, killed by the actual killer. Semantically, it's a perfect EC crime story, sexy, lusty, flirty, seduction immediately and ridiculously turning to love. In terms of syntax, you have to wonder, though, if she died because for being um, so sexually aggressive. Uh, we'll think about that. The death of the sexually aggressive woman in the crime books is no surprise, but with the exception of Before the Dawn, the women are usually more callous and cavalier. In the assault, another Wally Wood story, post-seduction, um, Lucy defies the usual post-coital marriage talk and instead says, well, thanks for the kicks. At the end, the, the uh, jilted, um, um, person, uh, man says, uh, what else could I do, Lucy? You were rotten through and through. You deserved it. And so Lucy ended up with six bullets in the face. Again, it seems punishment for sexual aggressive behavior. 
next page, we look at the most common crime story adds a third, this common um, crime story adds a third player, an unwanted husband or wife. In those cases, the initial seduction is between a handsome young man of lower station, like in this case, a pool man or a plumber, and a woman married to an older man she doesn't love, with lines like, perhaps he offered me security. The seduction narration often is filled with sexual illusion. The tidal wave rushing headlong, leaving in its wake after its fury is spent, only ruin and sadness. The seduction is quick, only a few panels. An equal number are spent on the second seduction, which is the conspiracy to commit murder. Notice the happy faces here in these crime comics. Here's the same pattern but emphasizing the semantics of the supposedly high life, the theaters, nightclubs, social life, one big continuous wild spree, all part of the seduction. Now, in most of these double indemnity uh, style stories, the last panel shows either the woman or the lover in jail or in the hands of the police. The O. Henry twist is usually for the wrong murder. Wealth and that life in the fast lane is often part of the iconography, as we saw in the last page, but not always. Let's look at this flirtatious woman, the sweat, the embrace, the time jump to being in love, and then the second seduction, where she says, she actually says, I've got a gun, Ralph. It could be easy. Easy to end up in the gas chamber. In terms of syntax, the seduction in most of these stories is not really about sex. Ultimately, it's about generational divisions. Um, the, the couple uh, wishing to kill the old man, the old husband. A commentary on values, consumerism, about a fast lane that ultimately ends poorly. And like film noir of the same period, there's a femme fatale usually pulling the strings who gets it in the end. In terms of horror, there were 29 issues of Vault of Horror between 1950 and 1955. There were 30 issues of Crypt of Terror, Tales from the Crypt, Crypt in the same period, and 28 issues of Haunt of Fear. Horror was clearly EC's most successful product. The story structure of the old husband, the young lonely wife, and the more attractive suitor is just as prevalent as, in, as is the quick seduction. In Pipe Down, listen to the description. He stood there in the glare of the cellar, cellar light bulb, the glow caressing his rippling muscles. Or the dialogue, you ought to have some fun. Yes, I ought to. I'll be around a lot. This furnace is badly in need of repair. It plays out over and over, even more focused on wealth to create a more gothic vibe than with the crime books. But often the woman is a bit tamer. She's often the more reluctant one. She is seduced by attention. Um, and the sexual seduction is almost perfunctory in terms of semantics. Graham Ingalls and Jack Davis are not trying to draw beautiful women in the same way the crime artists were. Notice in, in the, uh, the final one, the even husbands can be dull at times the uh, would-be suitor or suitor uh, suggest. And no one goes to jail in these final panels. Instead, the husband often gets revenge, feeding the suit for the betrayal, feeding the suitor to the hungry dogs, such as in the um, top right panel uh, page. Um, uh, that's what happens to, to Stephen. Or framing the suitor to be tortured by voodoo priests, as in the bottom lower, um, as happens. Sometimes, though, like the crime books, there's a secondary seduction murder plan between the, uh, the younger couple, just like in crime books. For example, in this story, Graham Ingalls squash anyone, the elephant tamer is seduced by his lover into squashing his wife with the trained elephant. Here on the last page, we see the dead wife and the rotted corpse of the elephant uh, return to take vengeance. Thus, at the end, we see horror instead of jail and justice. In these books and with these artists, there's no governmental justice, no law and order. Vengeance is a primal force. 
the natural order of things. In science fiction and fantasy um, genre for EC, there were 22 weird sciences, same number of weird fantasy, seven weird science fantasy. All, um, none of this were their best sellers, uh, but there's more, much more variety in terms of seduction. There were time travel seductions, space seductions, post-apocalyptic seductions, alien seductions, and android seductions. These comics, as I said, were not the best sellers, but they were the best looking with art by Wally Wood and Al Williamson, as well as Cayman and Orlando. In terms of semantics, in terms of semantics, the women looked similar, but the clothing was either tighter or more revealing in its interest or more revealing. It's interesting that the seduction is often incomplete, leaving out the next day caption or some sexual innuendo. Instead, the O. Henry twist is not jail or macabre vengeance, but a form of coitus interruptus as a low love interest turns out to be a robot or an android. We see in this case where um, at the end, it turns out that the the person who sounds just like in the crime books where sure, I'll go out with you. I'm bored with my husband or I'm with uh, um, my boyfriend. And then it turns out at the end that um, um, she's a she's a robot. Um, or in this last uh, this a uh, story called The Last Man on uh, The Last Man, where he literally is the last man on earth, he finds the last woman, only discover uh, it's his long lost sister. And there'll be some changes made. The astronaut marries a beautiful alien, only to find out, quote, these people are like the, a variety of snails back on earth that are hermaphroditic. They change sex, the male changes to female and gulp vice versa. And the changed um, alien uh, wife is now um, a husband saying, uh, I wish you'd hurry up and change so that we can be normal again. Uh, the syntax of the uncertainty of what lies ahead um, is, is of the uncertainty of what lies ahead, a general anxiety as to our place in the changing world. The maidens cried is similar to there will be some changes made in that it's more about communities than individuals. All the aliens are snail-like or moth-like. They are not evil, they are completely different. But in the maidens cried, men were stupid and easily seduced and they died for it. Uh, which is a theme we're gonna see a lot of. Um, it's even more the case in Bum Steer, where an otherworldly temptress promises more girls in the next room with drooling men responding, come on, them dames have been waiting too long. The soul dissenters warning, don't listen to her. We're food for those creatures. That's a slaughterhouse in there, but that goes unheeded. Again, look how science fiction is about in both of the last two stories I, I discussing about how gro whole groups are making the mistake being seduced not the individual but communities societies are being seduced um, that's i think where science fiction um, differs then we get to the humor of seduction um, notice the the um, the uh, good girl art is back um, like it was in, um, in, in science fiction and in the, uh, the crime books. Um, there were 23 issues of man and 12 issues of panic. Uh, the seductions, the seductions are longer in intensity. Um, if you notice the number of, of panels, uh, of devoted to the seduction and the the energy the the um, kinetic energy of it, of the chasing uh, of the aggressive uh, nature of the women is exaggerated um, uh, in these um, now all the same elements are there as before only they now um, semantically speaking are more aggressive um, ultimately 
I'll, I'll just show this uh, for a second. It's, it's one of, um, when I think it's really about sexual buildup, as you see uh, the girl, similar to V Vampires also by Wood, uh, being chased, but the sounds and the things, the momentum as if in foreplay, and then you get to Marlon uh, uh, Brando, uh, Brand Flakes, and uh, at that moment, as he rises, it's gosh darn it, out of gas. Uh, I think there, um, uh, there's a lot of uh, behind the um, uh, just sense of humor that's that's probably um, uh, beyond a lot of its readers. Um, flob was a slob is one I just want to look at um, to to close out uh, where she has to pick between the the criminal the crime guy that badly treats her and a and a slob. Um, and we get a message where after he, we see all the, the tropes from all the things we've been talking about, where uh, she's, she goes for fancy dinners and plays, and there were cocktail parties uh, where she met the world's great diplomat, scientist, and comic book artist. Uh, there was the cool wet kisses of, uh, with him shirtless, just like we see um, um, if, as if he was a plumber. Then there were the nightclubs, we made her a handsome couple sipping her drinks and then there was love, but everywhere I was followed by the haunting eyes of Sheldon. But the love is obviously the fireworks and uh, the completion of the seduction. At the end, we see where she says, but now I can go back to my true love. Back here on the public corner, selling reefers. Think I wanna chase butterflies all my life? Yahoo, it's the nightclubs for me. Hey kids, wanna buy some weed cheap? Come on, before the teacher comes. Therefore, going against all the other concepts uh, portrayed, the cautionary tales of all of the other genres, um, it becomes ultimately hedonism and, and greed went out, uh, satirically speaking. It becomes obvious in reviewing the stories I've looked at. The same concept gets recycled from one genre to another. Jealous husbands, lonely women, sexy pool men pop up in all the books. But the results do have subtle differences in terms of syntax. Uh, and meaning worth studying. I, I want to close with one final observation. I just want to acknowledge that some of EC's best stories and best comics are about a different kind of seduction. Things like the seductive power of bigotry and racism uh, and the harm that spreads or the seduction of patriotic lust for war or um, uh, actual literal seduction in terms of, of uh, drug addiction. Um, and uh, thank you. And Hi, I'm Sydney Heifler. I'm a comic book historian who specializes in romance comics. So I've been working on romance comics for quite some time now, about eight years. I started at community college and then I did my honors thesis on them at UC Davis. And then I went to the University of Oxford where I did my master's thesis on British romance comics. And now I'm my first year PhD student at the Ohio State University in the Department of History, where you guessed it, I am still researching romance comics. So through this very long interaction with romance comics, I of course came across the work of Matt Baker. And like everyone else, I fell in love with his work. And today you're seeing um, part of the result of this ongoing love affair with Matt Baker's work, which I have titled Seduction on the Page, Matt Baker and the Female Form. So for those of you who don't know who Matt Baker was, he was a black comic book artist, often credited as the first black comic book artist who worked on comics during the golden age until the end of the 1950s when unfortunately he died at a very young age. However, though Baker died at a very young age, he very much influenced the comic book world. He influenced his peers at the time he was making comics and he continues to do so. He was inducted into the Will Eisner Comic Book Hall of Fame in 2009. And most recently he was mentioned in Ken Quattro's book. I shouldn't say mentioned because it was much more extensive than that, but he was featured in Ken Quattro's book, Invisible Men, the trailblazing black artist of comic books, which I highly recommend if you want to know more about Baker's biography because Quattro has provided the best one that I have yet to see. Um, but today we're gonna be looking at Baker's romance comic work, specifically what he did for Archer St. John. And we're just looking at the covers today because that is where these themes of seduction in the female form really play out well. Um, so that's what we're going to be looking at. But let me give you a little bit of a background as to why I uh, want to look at this today. 
So I talk with a lot of people about romance comics, probably too much if you ask my family and friends, but when I do talk to people about romance comics, often people contextualize romance comic work as something that men did until they could get to more masculine genres such as superhero comics. So it's often, um, yes, these men worked on romance comics, but it's because superhero comics were not available at the time, the superhero work was not available at the time, or um, they worked on romance comics to prove that they could do comic work and then get work in superhero comics. Women, com women, women artists who worked on romance comics, of course, are not mentioned because no one talks about women, um, but there were, there were some women artists. But when people talk about Baker's work, it is very different. It is often of course, Baker worked on romance comics because he drew such gorgeous women. So instead of it being presented as sort of something at odds with um, his masculine nature, it is some sort of an extension of it. Um, whereas other men who worked on romance comics, it's presented as something that they had to contend with until they could get to more masculine genres. It's not that way for Baker. And I really wanted to see why. I wanted to see what made his women so different and what what made it seem like something that wasn't at odds with his masculinity. And um, before jumping into that, I need to mention that when people do talk about Baker's women, they often say, yes, of course, Baker drew such gorgeous women because he was a ladies man. So there is obviously an opportunity here to examine how the objectification of him as a black man has influenced this characterization of his romance comic work, which is something that I am researching right now. But for the purposes of today's talk, we're going to look at the contents of his romance work and talk about how they are visually um, different in other romance comic work, or talk about what makes his romance comic work special. So before I jump into that, we need to talk about good girl art because that's really where Baker's work is situated. So good girl art, the term, it's been argued about when this term was invented. Some people say it was invented in the 1930s and some people say it was invented in the early 1970s by David T. Alexander, um, who was a consultant from the comic book price guide. So people say that he started using this term to point out when comics featured art, um, specifically art that depicted women in a way that was good for the male viewer, pleasing to the male viewer. So regardless of when this term actually appeared, this is what this term indicates. It indicates these comics feature women in a way that is pleasing to men. And this is um, a perfect example of this. This is Torch Number no. 5 done by Bill Ward, who is known for his good girl art. Um, and we see Torchy here depicted it very much in that way. She is standing in a very pleasing pose in a very uh, revealing outfit, which is a characteristic of good girl art, and she is pleasing to the male viewer both on and off the page. But I need to mention the good girl art intersected within was an obvious conversation with the pinup. So the pinup art also came out around the same art became noticed around the same time as good girl art during the 1930s, and of course it, it became very popular during the 1940s. Um, it was used as sort of a visual enticement or a visual reward for men, or at least it was, it was very much presented that way. Um, and so the pinup also, when good girl art evokes the pinup style, it is signaling that it is for male pleasure because the pinup was created for male pleasure. But I do want to note, of course, there is a feminist history to the pinup. Women interact with and use the pinup for their own pleasure. But for the purposes of this talk, I just want to emphasize how good girl art was even more so signaling that it was for male consumption. And um, this is one way that was part of the pinup tradition or intersected with the pinup tradition. And to really bring this point home, we have this here, Torchy number four, um, done by Gil Fox. And we see here how the Torchy is in the pinup style and in the good girl art style. She is in a classic pinup outfit and she is um, there for the viewing of servicemen who uh, the Navy, a, a Navy submarine base and a bunch, they're all looking at her through their submarines. And I think it's really funny and a very fun cover. So Matt Baker is, of course, one of the most celebrated good girl artists, and this is 
often used as one of the top examples of good girl art on any blog or book that mentions or in any book that mentions good girl art phantom lady number 17 is extremely famous it was mentioned in seduction of the innocent and so this is just a very obvious example of how baker is a very well-known good girl artist but uh, often people do not mention how his romance comics fit into this. So let's move on to that. I think that his romance comics are some of the best examples of how his work was a part of the good girl tradition. I think this cover is, is a very obvious example. We have a woman in a red bathing suit. And remember bathing suits, um, I think I mentioned this. If I didn't, I'm mentioning it now. Bathing suits were very much part of the good girl art tradition. And so here we have, and the pinup tradition, obviously. So here we have a woman in a red bathing suit lounging. She looks very attractive. I don't think I need to explain why she is, would be um, pleasing or seductive to the male viewer. But what is interesting is unlike the torchy cover, the man is not looking at her. He is very upset because he is worried she will go off and get another boyfriend once he leaves. I also wanna point out the woman in the background who is also in the good girl art style. She is in a bikini and I just love this because it's very much um, mimicking another cover that Baker did earlier. Um, here we have a very similar bikini and a woman who is also in the good girl art style. And I think very much interacting with the pinup art style as well as most of Baker's uh, bathing suit covers did. So, but what I will say is that his women are much more active than traditional good girl art in his romance comic work. And they're having a lot of fun. They have a lot of agency. She's being very playful, obviously. And then here we have a more sort of static depiction, a more, um, I think, and in that way, a more traditional representation of good girl art. And here is this one, I'm specifically talking about the woman in the green bathing suit with the polka dots. She, she's obviously in the good girl art style, but we also have the woman in the background in the white bathing suit. And I love that because it reminds me of the creature of the Black Lagoon, that moment with the white bathing suit. And I want to point out how this man is carrying a woman, which is very also something that very much appears in Baker's romance comic work. And I think that also helps him co code his comics as uh, spaces friendly to readers who are men, because men are often shown not quite dominating because there's a lot more agency at play here from women, but they're very much playing an active role in controlling the space and sometimes in directly controlling women. Although in this situation, this woman is, uh, I should say teenager because they're supposed to be teenagers, um, has very much taken control of the situation. She has set this up, which is something that Baker's women often do. They often set up their romantic situations and trap men in very fun ways that men enjoy. And we have um, another example of how I feel like he, Baker, has perhaps stepped away from like the really traditional good girl art, art style, but still uh, evoking it and, um, and still very much in conversation with it. We have a woman who's in a very, uh, still a very revealing outfit and being carried by a man once again. And once again, this is very much more playful though, um, especially in terms of the woman being playful and not just there for men to look at. And her friends want her to come back on the bus, but she's having fun with this friend of hers who's actually going to take him, her back to his car for a ride instead. And then we have Teenage Romances number 38, and this is my all-time favorite Matt Baker cover. And I really, I included this to show how he, he really kind of developed this element of seduction in his covers that I feel really helped bring out his good girl style, even when the good girl art was less obvious and also just made his comics a lot more fun than some other romance comics, which I think has to do with his popularity. But we have a woman who is very fully clothed. She's not in the swimsuit, but her curves are still very much accentuated here. And uh, she's still very attractive, as we can tell from the reaction of her her friend here. And this is a very fun moment of seduction. And, and it's still it's still creating a space, I think, that is very friendly to readers who are men and to modern fans that are men. And now I'm going to show you some examples, uh, three examples from people who did romance comic work that were not Matt Baker to kind of really show you how Matt Baker 
uh, his work was much more drawn from the good girl style and much more uh, inviting to viewers who are men in that way. So we have a cover here done by Jack Kirby, Young Romance number three. And I love Jack Kirby. I love everything he did for romance comics. He's one of their co-creators. I love so much of his romance comic work, but this is not evoking good girl art at all. And her outfit is, um, she is in a wedding dress that is very much swallowing her. There's nothing really attractive about this. Uh, so it's really not doing the same thing that Baker's work does. And then we have this absolutely crazy cover by Ogden Whitney. I love Ogden Whitney. Um, but this is another example of how you can, you can create a cover that is not evoking good girl art. Uh, we have a shop girl here who I think is daydreaming about this man jumping through a drum. And there is an angry shopper who is frustrated because she cannot get the attention of the daydreaming girl. But uh, once again, not the same as Matt Baker's work, perhaps not creating that space for readers who are men. And then we have Exotic Romances number 28, possibly featuring the least exotic situation of all. Um, it's the least exotic romance comic cover. Uh, we have a woman and uh, we have two men and this isn't even like there's no seduction taking place and the, the men are not in charge at all and the and the, the woman is not even having fun. But anyways, the point is, is that this is a cover that is not doing the same thing that Baker's work does. And so I think we can kind of start seeing how and why people contextualize Baker's work differently than they contextualize the work of other covers done by comic book artists and by other men specifically. Because remember, women are not yet in the conversation. And so back to Baker. So we have Teenage Romances number 18. So I really, I brought this back to kind of show how though Matt Baker is using this good girl art style and perhaps objectifying women, he still gives them a lot of agency. They have a lot of fun. They're enjoying this moment. So I think it's much more empowering than a lot of other good girl art. And I think it makes his comics a lot of fun. And um, we see this, this dancer, well, of course, these women usually get in trouble in the comics, but that's not Baker's fault. He did not write them. Usually Dana Dutch wrote the stories that he drew for St. John. But so we, we have this example. And then we have this one where I feel, um, so she is very much clothed. I still feel like she is part of the good girl tradition and how she is posed, but really I included this more for humor because I find it very funny. Um, she is telling us, it also is an example of how Matt Baker gave women um, a lot of agency and how they crafted their comics and how St. John in general did this, where women kind of tricked men into being in like into behaving how they wanted them to so they could have the romantic relationships that they wanted and i think that's one reason why baker's work was really able to shine through at saint john so we have this woman who is uh telling this man like oh there isn't anyone else for me but you there will never be anyone else and there's a bunch of other sailors coming up and one of them says there's dorothy now i thought you two were engaged so you see how women can be much more in control in this sort of act of seduction and in this moment in their moments of supposed objectification that you expect from this good girl art style and we're at the end but i wanted to end with one of the funniest matt baker covers which once again plays on this very extreme sort of um, moment of women taking control of the situation uh, where she is i i believe she has seduced the man i'm not quite sure but um he doesn't he doesn't seem to be conscious and she might actually be checking for a pulse i feel like this is almost a joke that matt baker is playing with this cover so i really wanted to end on that note thank you so much for listening Everybody loves Archie Andrews, right? I mean, the guy's even on TV these days. So let's explore, let's investigate how Archie, that comic, got started. In fact, let's explore that entire genre of 1940s and early 50s teenage humor comics that uh, Archie gave birth to. Uh, that whole world of malt shops and jukeboxes and seductions played for laughs. And along the way, we're going to stop by to visit Harvey Gertzman and Al Feldstein, Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland, Chuck Berry and Little Richard, and Frederick Wortham. So let's start where Archie started with this guy right here, Bob Montana. <laughs> 
Archie's first appearance was inside Pep Comics. And back then, we weren't taking Archie's supposed irresistibility for granted. Oh, Archie. You know, back then, his uh, figurative personality hadn't yet become as two-dimensional as his literal printed image. And here he's active and dynamic, doing screwball stuff to impress the new girl in the neighborhood, a preteen Betty who's already crushing on him. And here's the first issue of Archie in his own comic book in 1942, drawn by Bob, and sharing the contents with B-tectives and squirmy worms. Uh, back when the mirth of a nation was not a D.W. Griffith call out and nobody even noticed, much less cared that, yes, but can he swim is a question, not an exclamation. And here we also see the early makings of the, if you've read one Archie, you've read them all, this whole eternal triangle in which Betty is devotedly in love with our hero and Archie longs for the spoiled Veronica, and the two girls are catty at each other. And this is also a rundown of the whole idea. If you read one Archie, you've read them all, right? Uh, and that same simplistic formula lasted for most of the last eight, 80 years. Hmm. Not exactly the crazy Ignatz and Office of Pup triangle, is it? Anyway, true confession right away. Bob Montana is by far my most favorite Archie Comics artist ever. But wait, you say, Bob Montana's illustrations are yeah, so primitive when you compare them with Dan DiCarlo's and Harry Lucy's much more sophisticated style. Okay, uh, here's Lucy on the right with his standard uh, face rendering style where his character's mouths are pushed over from under their noses to the side of their faces. Um, but the problem for me uh, with Lucy is that his drawing is extremely flat and very static and a whole lot less vibrant and fun than Bob's on the left. I mean, we're talking direct comparison of the same joke. And here's to Carlo, right, on the right, with his standard formulaic flirty pinup girl pose. And once again, we have a comparatively flat cover. And yeah, Bob's Betty has a waistline that's laughable, but hey, back then Bob was creating a humor comic that was also visually light and playful, rather than aspiring to be good girl arty. And if you take a look at Betty's pose over there on the left, it's actually quite sleek and elegant. And another thing that should be pointed out with these two other guys is these books had the Comics Code Authority seal of approval on them, and Bob Montana's didn't. So more on that coming up. But a little background on Bob. Before Archie Comics became Archie Comics, we're talking 1946, Back when all the publishers were cashing in on the superhero trend, it was called MLJ Comics. And here's this cover that Bob did with Black Hood and these other muscle men with their shoulders to the grindstone, crushing the Axis powers, the leaders of Germany, Italy, and Japan uh, caricatured as such patriotic super comics tend to do during World War II. And uh, one of those two hilarious new features in this issue was one of Bob's very first Archie, maybe only his fifth or sixth, where he's rendered <laughs> basically the prototype for Howdy Doody right there in the center. Buffalo Bob sends his thanks. Yeah, once upon a time, Bob's Archie had some pretty crazy story, very story, very imaginative in those exploratory days, you know, much more than practically everything else that Archie Comics has done since then, up until now. For example, I defy you to look at this and figure out what the heck this one's going to be about, just based on that first panel, right? Huh. Okay, World War II ends and MLJ drops all its superhero titles so it can focus on its teen humor line. That was what was bringing in the money. And this is actually one of Bob's transitional covers midway between. It's like Bob Black Hood is the main attraction, but Susie, 
uh, stereotypically dumb blonde who went on to have her own teen humor comic book, uh, is also foregrounded there in red. And as I mentioned, Archie was first published inside Pep. And here we're looking at him gradually taking over the book. On the right, uh, Pep is plugging Archie's new radio show. And for you fans of covers within a cover fans, uh, Bob's cover there on the left has three. And OK, about the origin story of Archie, that's in dispute, OK? The founder, the co-publisher and editor of Archie, John Goldwater, takes full credit as the sole creator, right? Do you, you feel a Stan Lee story coming on? But according to Bob and other people who were working at MLJ at the time, Goldwater's instructions were on the line of, mm, give me something that's not a superhero. And here, as you can even see from Bob's 1937 and 38 diaries, he was sketching ideas for a teenage comic strip at least several years before he even began freelancing with MLJ in 1941. And hey, Benny Goodman. So Goldwater told him, the war is over, superheroes are on their way out, uh, come up with a teenage comic. From there, Jack Kirby, I mean, Bob Montana created the characters and developed the narrative. And not only did Bob create the characters, before that he actually hung out with many of them, uh, using them as prototypical reference for the characters. And hell, he even dated Betty. Uh, here they are down there on the lower right, okay? And Archie wasn't the very first teen humor comic. For that, you have to go back to 1919 when Carl Ede noticed, hey, there aren't any comic strips on adolescence in the newspapers. And in the 1920s and 30s, teens were becoming a desirable market for the first time, really. They had independent, expendable income. So, who? let's take notice of teenagers now. Okay, popular? Who boy. Um, Harold Teen had a silent movie uh, made in 1928 and this musical over here from 1934. And the strip ran 40 years, up until 1959. And it's important to understand the importance of places like Harold's Hangout, the Sugar Bowl Soda Shop, with Pop Jenks as the proprietor, because that's the place where all the teens would hang out together after school. And if you're doing comic stories, you know high school kids don't really want to spend a lot of time reading about being in school. So. Uh, same thing with the teen humor comics in the 1940s. Here we see the soda jerk foaming at the fountain over, wait for it, Junie Prom. Mm. And you can find all sorts of ways that Bob's iconic Archie prototypical characters and situations have started trends in these comics. You, know, you can see the blonde, the brunette, the cattiness going on there. And even Archie's comics. Uh, they were publishing Katie Keene, Bill Wagen, and uh, Katie occasionally stopped by the soda fountain for, among other sweet treats, a deep dip Sunday by a little dip, says so right there on the wall to the right. And oh, what can I say? Bob Montana. Love him. Um, and recycle jokes? Yeah, you bet. You know, and uh, the one on the right, uh, Al Fagley, was about the best, as I see it, in capturing Bob's spirit pre the whole DiCarlo style guide. And <laughs> check out that pinched waistline. <laughs> right? And yeah, variations on a theme that Bob uh, would do. And uh, other publishers wouldn't rip him off because really, when you're working that genre, there are just so many obvious jokes, right? And whoo, Sheldon Meyer. Uh, and uh, over to the left, three on a match, a now nearly forgotten war reference. Uh, and Archie was in large part an attempt to capitalize on MGM Pictures' successful Andy Hardy movies of the late 1930s, yeah. <laughs> located in some idealized American city that never was, right? Including, as you can see, the uh, soda shop setting and uh, to move ahead to those wholesome 1950s, 
where, as you can clearly see here, teens would just enjoy their hot dogs with their dates on these innocent get togethers and not even thinking about having sex with each other, right? And comic books for teens were the educational tool that taught them all how to be well behaved. Or did they? Juvenile delinquents out for fast kicks, exclamation point. And Jimmy and Natalie, lower right, they both came from good families, but my God, what happened to them? Obviously, it's those damn comics. Yeah. <laughs> Right? No cause. What are you rebelling against, Johnny? What do you got? It is my, it is opinion, my opinion, without, without any, any reasonable, reasonable doubt, doubt, and without, and any, without reservation, any reservation, that comic, that comic books, books are an important, are an important contributing, contributing factor, factor in many, in many cases, cases of juvenile, of juvenile, juvenile, juvenile. Delinquent. There you go. Okay, here's the problem. Uh, instead of wholesome, funny books, teenagers were being exposed to Jim Thompson's EC Comics and <gasps> Sidney Heifler's Matt Baker. And uh, this one here is by Al Feldstein, one of Matt Baker's mm, bosom buddies in uh, his pre-EC 1940s days. And uh, as Wortham put it, for comics that look like this, they're specializing in highly accentuated and protruding breasts in practically every illustration, what adolescent boys call headlight comics. This is a very successful way to stimulate a boy sexually. God forbid we should do that. And uh, Wortham himself actually never got his sweaty hands on Junior and Sonny uh, because by the time he got around to his book, Teen humor was pretty much all already on its way out, thanks to the unpopularity of Tales from the Crypt and Phantom Lady. Yes, horror and romance comics helped murder the teen humor comics. And then the Comics Code Authority, founded and directed by Archie's John Goldwater, murdered horror and romance comics. Uh, I think it was revenge killing, actually. I mean, the Comics Code stipulated that females shall be drawn realistically without exaggeration of any physical qualities. So even Feldstein's Junior and Sonny, which were basically Fox Features' answer to the Archie line, wouldn't pass the test, right? And, but, you know, in the early 50s, there were all sorts of very successful ways to stimulate men sexually, <laughs> like the 1955 Cadillac Coupe de Ville. Uh, you know, Wortham called them headlights, automobile enthusiasts called them Dagmars. And seriously, comics didn't have any real significant effect on teens. They're just not that important. But you know what did have its an effect? Come on out here, preacher, and testify for us. These men come down here from New York, New York Florida, Florida, to find out my name. Reasons of vulgar and why I preach against, against it, and I believe with, with all of my heart, heart that it is a contributing, a contributing factor, factor to our juvenile of today. today. I 100% believe. believe. Why I believe why that I believe is because, that is because, because I know how it feels when you sing it. I know what it does to you. And I, I know, and I know uh, the, evil uh, the evil feeling that you feel, that you when, you feel when you sing it. I know the, I know the, 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 the lost, lost position, position that you get into, you get into in, the in the feet. Well, uh, well uh, if you talk if you to the average teenager, teenager of today and you ask them, them what it is about rock and roll, rock and roll music, music that they like, they like and they'll, the, and they'll, first the first thing they'll say is the beat, the beat, the beat. And yeah, that's the situation with comics. They don't have a beat, right? You know, but uh, here you have the beat of Bill Haley's Rockin' Around the Clock Tonight. Uh, you had a whole lot of shaking going on with Jerry Lee Lewis. And you had the attractive, charismatic Chuck Berry with Sweet Little Sixteen. And you even had an androgynous Little Richard, Duty Fruity, okay? And teenagers were seeing this and digging this in the 1950s the segregated 1950s. And yes, letting the good times roll was one of the most important kickstarts of the civil rights movement. And uh, 
away from the racism and sexism and oppression of the 1950s, which was basically the make America great for the first time era. Uh, and music was important to teens even back in the jazz and the jitterbug era and into the 1940s with our humor comics. And then an invention came along that really brought teenagers together and uh, music with music. And what's behind that couple in the upper right photo? Well, gee, dad, it's a Wurlitzer. And jukeboxes started catching on in the 1940s. And of course, they became really popular in the 1950s. But from, from the jump, from the 40s, uh, it was a source of teen humor, comics, gags, and the dating rituals of funny teen comics. And, you know, there's no real easy explanation for the increase in juvenile delinquency in the 1950s. It involves a number of factors, but Archie comics and media like those that were burgeoning at the time, the Hazy and Harriet type TV shows of the 50s, they provided us an escape, a comfort, uh, a lie, really. So uh, I'm going to let my favorite comics artist, Harvey Kurtzman with Will Elder, take us out on those teen comics and bring us back to reality with a brief name check of two of their finest satirical works. Starting the first is Starchy, one of Mad's most br brutal takedowns back in its comic book days, back in 1954. As you can see from the cover, it is the typical story of typical America's most hated typical teenager. And what it was doing was mocking and ridiculing the self-righteousness of the parental approval branding that uh, Goldwater was doing with his Archie line, right? And uh, basically also the, uh, that, that approval expanded to Goldwater's self-regulating uh, translation, self-censoring arm of the comics industry. And, and uh, in summary, basically the Comics Code Authority was uh, comics own haze codes, if you, haze code, if you will, enforcing wholesome, upright standards of mor morality and uh, in the case of comics, destroying EC in the process, uh, spoils of war. And you know, it included a, a deconstruction of Archie's, all sorts of Archie's rampant uh, absurdities. And of course, it had to involve a soda fountain showdown, right? And so that's one. If you haven't seen it, please seek it out. And also, and particularly this, this is Harvey and Will's Goodman Beaver character, uh, who's basically a modern day Candide, searching for a place where honor is still sacred and virtue triumphs. And uh, these series of strips ran in uh, Help Magazine. They had actually started up in the late 1950s. And so what you hear uh, with Goodman, Go Play Goodman Goes Playboy is, uh, really pretty much it's um, his most famous story uh, where uh, Harvey and Will used parodies of the Archie characters, uh, not to take jabs at Archie, but at the playboy lifestyle that was so preeminent in those, in those days uh, with playboy just having started uh, uh, about five or six years earlier. And uh, actually their target, Hugh Hefner loved it. He was, you know, as they said back then, cool. And while this wasn't at all an attack on Archie this time, uh, Goldwater threatened a lawsuit, uh, and perhaps he was just still smarting from that dead on uh, Starchy. <sighs> and so finally, the last page, <laughs> spoiler alert, uh, which brings us back to the Pop Tate's soda shop of the, in the world of Archie. And, you know, and, and this rendering, this is the best ever uh, teenage hangout with all sorts of visual treasures. Again, you know, this is, we're, we're talking with both of these seven, eight pages that are just ones you really want to spend quality time with. You know, little touches, just even like, you know, you look at uh, Goodman, who's a square, you know, he has a box for a speech balloon, right? And the devil uh, in the background 
uh, who the Archie character has sold his soul to as a skull balloon, right? And so uh, uh, this is happening and the story concludes with Goodman contemplating, hmm, moving on, uh, while <laughs> all the other men in the uh, pop soda shop uh, queue up to sell their soul as well, because decadence looks like so much fun. And so they're uh, in line, getting his foot trounced on over on the left is the character who launched the whole teen humor comics genre back in 1999, <laughs> 1919 in the first place, Harold Teen. So thank you, Harold. It's been fun. Well, I, th I believe that's all we have time for since we uh, both, all, we all three really enjoyed diving into our papers, but I, uh, I, I'm really glad we did this, this round table and hopefully we get to meet again and do another one that's not over the virtual platform. Yes, I'd like to see everybody in person next year. Definitely. Thank you so much for watching wherever you are on the YouTube. Take care. <laughs>